What is up, people of Westeros? Welcome back to my House of the Dragon, episode two, titled The Rogue Prince. Breakdown, recap, and review at the end as well. We're going to briefly go over the promo for the next episode, but that will be at the very end. For those of you who want to go in completely blind in the future episodes, don't worry. There will be quite a bit of warning before that. But this episode most certainly pushed that plot along. I mean, we're over half a year into the future, if you will, with Damon taking over Dragonstone and various other things. So there's quite a lot to talk about, especially where things can go. I'll be reading every single comment down in the comments below. So definitely looking forward to your thoughts and theories for future episodes ahead. But let's start this off right at the beginning. And that is where we pick up with crabs eating the bodies of men in the sand and, you know, various people are being eaten alive. And as we know, this has been quite an ongoing plot line since episode one, over six months previously, where we had Lord Corliss talking about the Stepstones and this new force that is amounting there and the way he feels as though, even though he's been a bit soft to address this at times with King Viserys, that, you know, you're kind of not doing anything about it. But as we know in the small council chamber at the very beginning here, even though they offer to compensate him and his ships and his crew, he doesn't really care about that. He wants to seize the Stepstones by force and burn out this crab feeder. And we did get some creepy looks at uh, Kragus Drehar, that's the name of this crab feeder at various points in this episode, and of whom will be heavily featured in episode three, I imagine, with the ending of this episode and what that set up between Damon and Lord Corliss. But the way King Viserys feels about this is that if he does that, then maybe he will be starting an open war with the free cities. This conversation in the small council chamber opens up a whole other frustration that Lord Corliss is feeling with the current state of the crown under King Viserys' rule, and that is there is a bit of fear with regards to the crown because it is in quite a vulnerable position. The king's own brother has been allowed to seize Dragonstone and fortify it with an army of gold cloaks, and he's squatted there for over half a year without protest from the crown, and thus that kind of gives off a little bit of a bad message. We now have no queen. That isn't too great as that echoes throughout the lands month by month. Not only that, the first woman in, I guess, Westerosi history, that of Rhaenyra, has been named heir. So overall in this episode, things, you know, there, there are some vultures, so to speak, preying on this weakened Targaryen rule. And the thing is, despite becoming heir, Rhaenyra is still cup holder. So in this episode, and they get into this a little bit in the behind the scenes, not much has really changed. Despite being the heir, it hasn't really made any difference of opinion in that of the Lords of the Council. For example, in this very moment, she suggests sending dragon riders to settle this, which to be honest, is a good suggestion. If a dragon flew to the Stepstones, I'm pretty sure they could burn the living crowd out of Kragos Drehar and, and the Stepstones being taken over. But <laughs> everyone's just like, what did you just say? Did you just say a really good idea? No, we will pretend you never said that. I know she is young, as her father said towards the end of the episode, and that added another burn into Rhaenyra. She just wants her father, obviously, to see her more than his little girl. But she does make a good point, and I think she is very much so, and very clearly this episode, out to prove her worth. But that, obviously, is going to be very much so a tug of war for her, especially as she somewhat began to learn a little bit more in that conversation with Princess Renice in terms of it is the order of things. It just is the way it is with regards to, you know, the men of the realm and the women. And so to get her out the room, they're like, hey, yeah, yeah, well, you know, Sir Harold, why don't you take Rhaenyra to see about the new Kingsguard posting of the Lord Commander? And that is, of course, because we learned right at the beginning that Sir Rhyme, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, died in his sleep. And so immediately she goes out to review a few knights and we, we see a few names being mentioned. But the thing is, the lands have been in quite a bit of peace for many decades now so these knights that are going up before the princess Rhaenyra don't have any combat experience other than Sir Criston Cole of whom obviously if you guys remember in episode one over six months prior he asked for her favor at the tourney but he is also the only one with combat experience and he mentioned he was a foot soldier against the Dornish incursions and Sir Alan Dondarrion knighted him after they raised the two watchtowers along the bone way so in this moment she chooses Kristen Cole, but we have the Hand of the King, Lord Hightower, good old 
Otto saying, yeah, don't go so hastily because he wanted to take into account some of the politics that could be gained from choosing one of the other knights, but she just kind of laid her hand down. Like, I don't really give a crap if we appointed someone else and I got us in good favor with houses such as Krakul or Malist or whatever. I want somebody who has combat experience and who can protect my father. I really like how insistent she is and obviously she's going to have to have a lot more of that up her sleeve to navigate her way to the place she wants to be and I'm sure we will get that especially a bit later with that scene at Dragonstone but more on that in a little bit but meanwhile we have good old lady Alison spending time with King Viserys. Obviously it was very much so foreshadowed and hinted that Lord Hightower, the Hand of the King, was somewhat, even though he seems to have good interests for King Viserys, he also wants to solidify, I guess you could say, his own house. So despite this episode, it being proposed by Lord Corlys and his wife, Princess Renice, to take the Lady Lyanna as his wife. And then that went into, uh, yeah, very questionable. Either way, either way, this is the way for Lord Hightower this whole time. Even though, as this was made very clear in the behind the scenes, Lady Alicent doesn't have any ulterior motives of her own, her father still sent her in there to kind of, you know, get to know him a bit. Although for her, she is just enjoying his company. She relates to him losing his wife as, you know, she's lost her own mother. And it's just a bit of companionship, I, I guess. But obviously, feelings are coming into it. I love the models that the stonemason had made of the old Valyria and how we got that moment where we had King Viserys explain to Lady Alicent about how the capital was built into the volcano, much like Dragonstone. Genius idea, right, guys? Build your whole city and kingdom into a volcano. He talks about how back in those times it had over a thousand dragons, a navy large enough to span the seas of the world, but he doesn't reckon that the glory of old Valyria can be ever seen again to the likes of those numbers, which would be insane. Could you imagine King's Landing or somewhere like Dragonstone having like a thousand dragons at its disposal. In this moment as well, we got a teeny bit of a tease with regards to the connection they have. So he drops the dragon. I believe that was like a little model that we saw within King's Landing of Beleriand on the Black Dread. Of which this episode, we also learned that he was the last one to actually ride that dragon before he died. But anyway, she picked it up. And then when she gave it to him, there's a little, little bit of contact on the hand. You can clearly tell that he is appreciating her company. And I think even though it wasn't a part of the plan for her, she is you know, kind of also seeing something in him. They talk about not mentioning their meetings to Rhaenyra because he fears that she might not understand. You know, I do think if you had those fears for Ceres, you should have in that conversation later when you were basically confronting with her that, you know, you kind of have to take a wife because your duty is to the realm. You should have maybe mentioned that you had a little bit of an interest in your daughter's best friend before you announced it to the small council in front of her. God, I know I'm getting ahead of myself Myself, but you know speaking of that this is when Rhaenyra and Alicent are in the sept they pray but they also talk a bit about her father now this is obviously you know just paving even more for the future Rhaenyra says to Alicent that it's only been half a year since her mother died and already they tried to marry her father off and replace her as heir and the whole time it's just like Alicent is there thinking well I don't believe that she knew she was going to be the future queen or anything but there's definitely V vibes that she's not confirming to her best friend, the daughter of the man she's kind of connecting with. So, you know, I'm not saying she's mega, mega shady, but clearly in this episode, for example, when King Viserys later on said that he's going to remarry, she was like picking her, her fingers again, kind of very much so anticipating the answer. So she clearly kind of wanted to be the future queen, not in a massive ambitious way, but probably out of you know, the connection she's made with him. Not to mention when she nervously asks, what if your, uh, what if your father was to, uh, remarry, you know? <laughs> so again, yeah, and I think this will most definitely set up the future tension between these two characters. But I do believe, even though tension will be brought into this for sure, I think Lady Alicent will always be on this course to try and somewhat reconcile with Rhaenyra, I think. She's always going to pursue that, but Rhaenyra will always be like, well, you were my best friend, but now you're in, in my 
dad's bed, you know, so I think that's <laughs> it's got to be something to pay attention to. Now up next is where the beginning of uh, the trouble with Lord Corliss and Viserys begins because he kind of grants this private audience with him and his wife, which obviously is the Prince Renice, who was and could have very well been the Queen of the Iron Throne. But I believe, uh, maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but he calls her his favourite cousin, but that's definitely not true because his wife was technically his favorite cousin, if you know what I mean. He lays out the tensions that are basically weakening the throne. And now a foreign power, which we spoke about earlier under Kragas Dreha, has taken a colony in their most critical shipping lane. And the reason why Lord Corliss is so invested in this as well is because, as he mentions to Daemon Targaryen at the end, it would cripple their house and just have repercussions that are bad, which is what is building that low-key frustration from his side, seeing the king just having these, you know, tawnies and whatnot, and not really doing much about it. And I like the analogy Lord Corliss gives, though, because with regards to his rule and his reign and his vulnerable position that they point out to him, he says, to elude a storm, you can either sail into it or around it, but you must never await its coming. So, as a result, there needs to be action that is taken. And one way to do that, as Lord Corliss proposed is to unite their families, to wed their daughter, Leanna. In his mind as well, this would be a perfect match with regards to uniting the two great surviving Valyrian houses. But meanwhile, we have the king getting bandaged up on the same finger that was cut on the Iron Throne when he was confronting Daemon at the end of last episode. Now, he must have some kind of condition, and there's been a lot of theories out there that this could be grayscale, but I don't think it necessarily is. It seems that he has some kind of condition, and I'm no medical expert, but where if you cut like that, you can easily get to the point of where, uh, you know, it starts decaying and rotting, which is why the Grand Maester Melos, you know, got those maggots to try and eat away at the rot before it could get any further. But, you know, this must be for shadow some kind of ultimate end as what we spoke about in the episode one review and I, I know that's not hard to predict but clearly this is going to be a growing and growing and growing problem also another private audience I guess you could say was granted here outside the small council chambers because we had Lord Hightower there the hand of the king and the grand maester there and they well the maester essentially said that it would be wise to wed Lady Leanna and join the two houses and I was just thinking of Hightower in this moment obviously he didn't want to give away his hand in that he wants his daughter to be the future queen. He was saying that what the maester said, or his reasoning as he puts it, was sound. So he, again, he doesn't be like, oh no, 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 choose my daughter. But I think he's low-key confident that his play has been made, his daughter has been getting to know the king for the past six and a half plus months, so what will be will be. And it ultimately ends up being what he wanted, as we know, which is of course King Viserys to choose Lady Alison. But without getting too far into that, this is where we cut to King Viserys with Lady Lyanna, who is only, I, re I believe, around 12 at this time, talking to him. It gets to the point of where she's reciting lines, and this was so awkward because clearly, as King Viserys found out, did your father tell you to say that? It's just extremely uncomfortable, obviously, and this very much so solidified it for Viserys that, yeah, I don't, I don't want to wed her, you know, and, and also... Partly, probably, because he's actually got a little low-key connection with Alison. Plus, you know, Alison, we have to put this out there, is Lord Hightower's daughter. She's not a nobody. She is somebody viable also as an option to be queen. And that's when we got that scene between Princess Renice, the queen who never was, and Rhaenyra. And I did like this because it was a bit of an exchange that, as we went over earlier, so not to repeat myself too much here, that was an education. There is a bit of naivety there with Rhaenyra, even though she has this tenacity to her. It's all in the best interest of what should be happening for her. Her aspiring to be queen, her wanting to change the order once she's queen. But there is the wisdom of the princess who or should I say the queen who never was, in how you don't quite realize what you're saying will be done. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm going to do that. Way harder than you think. And you really need to see that men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne. And I love the next line. She says that your father is no fool. And that is essentially foreshadowing that even though your father gave you the rights to be the heir to the Iron Throne, he will realize at a certain point that people will not let that happen. It's, it's just not going to be accepted no matter how much your father is saying, you know, you're so important, you're my only heir right now. 
that will soon change. I'm betting your ass that it will change. And as she said, your father is no fool. Like, he will stop Rhaenyra, his daughter, being heir before it breaks out into a bigger, bigger, bigger problem. And that is, you know, torching the realm. And I think this is a little bit of a wake-up call for Rhaenyra to be like, well, damn, maybe I really do need to think about this a bit more, about the gravity of what is unfolding in the present, but also in the future. But this is when the small council was summoned in an emergency session because we have freaking good old Damon, six and a half months later, having stolen a dragon egg. And what infuriates the king even more so about this, because after Rhaenyra asked which dragon egg it was, it was found out to be Balon Targaryen's, the baby that unfortunately passed away, because it is Targaryen tradition when you have a baby, you place a dragon egg in the cradle. It's all a part of this kind of... I really love that idea that when you bond to your own dragon as a Targaryen, it's been with you ever since you were a little baby. And the dragon's kind of a little baby-esque thing in the, in the dragon egg. So there's that connection there. So for that comment to be made last episode by Damon, heir for a day, and now to take the egg is most certainly to stir a little bit of... BS between him and his brother, saying, you know, Daemon Targaryen, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, taking a second wife, as in the tradition of old Valeria, Missaria of Dragonstone, and that she is with child, which we found out all to be a lie. All of this, again, like, they weren't getting married, there was no kid, it was just to, I guess, poke the feathers of his brother and provoke some action there, which ultimately did work. Obviously, Lord Hightower was sent to Dragonstone. And so we have them arrive at Dragonstone and they all meet halfway. And this, honestly, without Rhaenyra, this would have ended very badly. Because obviously we had Daemon's dragon arrive, Caraxes, and it's just like, well, yeah, if you try and fight me, I'll just send the command Dracarys and you'll all be melted there and then, especially on top of Lord Hightower's insults to Daemon. And so that's when Rhaenyra makes her entrance. And I have to say, I love this. I didn't really expect it, to be honest. And it feels like something I should have expected, but that made it all the more welcome. I was like, yes, as I said, she has to assert herself even more, even though this pisses off her dad for like a, a minute, it's still just showing her potential. And this is a bit of a unique situation because you know Rhaenyra's uncle, Damon, really cares for her, yet he wants to be the heir and she's taken that away from him, but not through a direct way. So it's a bit complicated. Like he wouldn't do anything to her ultimately, which is why he walks away, gives her the egg back. She most certainly has some power over him there. Meanwhile, in the small council chambers, we have King Viserys ask Lord Lionel for his unencumbered opinion. And he essentially says, yeah, marry her. It would only be good, but he doesn't really want to. Which is when he's informed that the princess has arrived back from Dragonstone. He's like, what? Dragonstone? They have a bit of a conversation about this. He's initially kind of like, oh, but then I think he finds it kind of cool that his daughter managed to pull that off because you can't refuse what she achieved. They have that conversation and mutual understanding of how he needs to find a new wife, not that it would ever replace her mother. And so back in the small council chambers, we have Rhaenyra in cup holder mode. Everyone is ready for the king to announce, you know, I've decided to remarry Lady Alison. You know, just before that, we had Lord Corliss getting all giddy. It's like, oh, you know, Lady Leanne is going to be chosen. Our house is going to be united. Oh. Yeah, he calls it an absurdity. He leaves. We even have Rhaenyra look at Lady Alison and she leaves. So again, what I like about these first two episodes is they're sending out little ripple effects. Very much so the dominoes are falling, giving you little inklings and clues of what's to come for the fall of the House Targaryen. Because again, we can't forget that when Game of Thrones picks up in quite a while, don't get me wrong, there are only two Targaryens left. Meanwhile, with that scene we had with Daemon Targaryen and Lord Corlys, essentially we had Daemon being summoned to his house and they talk about how they're both the second son's men who have had to forge their own path. He believes they are cut from the same cloth. He also details how he's tried to petition the king and his navy into the territory of the Stepstones to sort out Kragas Dreha and how that could actually be a good thing for Daemon Targaryen because for people such as themselves or him, you might have to prove your worth and it would most certainly be proven if you sorted that problem out unlike the weak king if you will king Viserys isn't really 
doing right now. And so the episode ends with, you know, little features of the Crab King, if you will, but also Damon pondering this, which is when we get the promo and the behind the scenes of the episode. But before I get into that, just for those who don't want to watch that part of this video, I did thoroughly enjoy this episode. I felt like it kept up a similar pace to how well received the first episode was. I think I prefer the first episode, but I don't want to put down this second episode. It was still really, really good. It had some really good moments, some big plays of plot going on, some awesome moments when Rhaenyra comes in, and also, most importantly, big story moments that are just going to ripple and ripple and ripple out throughout the future. Without giving anything away too much from episode 3 for those who are still here, obviously things are going to accelerate in the timeline. So for example, episode 3, we're going to be a little bit further on from the end of this episode, for example, when the king announced that he was to wed Lady Allison. So that gives you a little bit of a clue for where things will pick up. Things will be a little bit accelerated down the timeline, even for like Damon and Lord Corliss with their plans for the Stepstones. What I like about this, even though I can imagine some people might not like how much time is going on between episodes, is that we get to the significant events in that of the House of the Dragon kind of history and what they're adapting here. The, the most important points of which, obviously, when we visit episode to episode, big things will be happening. I mean, sure, some bigger than other episodes, but I really enjoyed this one still. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. But let's now get into the promo very briefly for episode three. And that is where we see quite a few things. Now, the words that we hear is that the road ahead is uncertain, but the end is clear. Aegon will be king. He is the firstborn son of the king. So evidently here, the king has had a son with Lady Alicent, which obviously contributes to that conversation we were talking about earlier with how Princess Renes was warning Rhaenyra about how, you know, is she, is she really going to be heir? Because, you know, they rather torched the realm before having a lady ascend to the Iron Throne. Now the king's got a son. So is he going to go back on it? I wonder. And also what would this mean between Aegon and Rhaenyra for the future? Let's just say it's going to be a little bit of a sibling squabble there. And so we see the seeds planted for how uncomfortable Rhaenyra is with this, the very evident way her father may be going back on this, with King Viserys saying, you'll be with your own child sooner rather than late, and she's just like, well, I don't, I don't wish to get married. And that's where we hear the king just shouting at her, saying, even I do not exist above tradition and duty, Rhaenyra. So again, just him further trying to go back a little bit on what he said, trying to get Rhaenyra to just, you know, you know, have a kid and stuff, but she's like, but... I was meant to be the heir, <laughs> you know? We have Lady Allison as well, I think, trying to mend the bridges, as I was saying earlier, as best as she can, saying none of it has to be this way in truth or whatever, but she's like, bitch, please, like, do I really need to explain? As she says, no one's here for me, and she rides away. And also, I think we're gonna get an awesome, awesome battle scene. I mean, obviously, as we're seeing in the trailer, we hear the words, the crab feeder has dug in for siege on Bloodstone, while his men sabotage our fleet. The matter of Stepstone is regrettably urgent. Crabs will soon dine with all of us. We are losing. And that's where we see Damon and Corlys at war, and it looks like a dragon gets called in to burn the living crap out of those forces, um, of which, you know, as Rhaenyra suggested, they should have done that around this time. So quite evidently, the next episode is going to take place when, I guess, Aegon? It might take place a year or two in the future, because Aegon looks like a couple of years old there. So this would have meant that the Stepstones would have been unaddressed for some time, unless there was some engagement from Lord Corlys and Daemon Targaryen shortly after the conversation in episode two, but we see them geared up for battle in this episode, so who knows if it's been quite an ongoing battle for some time, because they did mention the siege, but obviously it's been hard, and I wonder why Daemon Targaryen couldn't just fly in on a dragon and absolutely decimate Kragas Dreher's forces at the Stepstones. That's something I'm looking forward to, but either way, it looks like it is going to happen next episode, so crazy stuff happening in the next episode, episode three of House of the Dragon. So let me know what you think and any theories you have for the next episode, guys. Of course, all of your theories down in the comments below for this episode and just the future in general. And I'd really appreciate a like on this video if you got this far. It really does help me get out there a little
little bit more break through the wall of the thrones algorithm that i currently don't really have on this channel so thank you if you contributed to that and maybe consider subscribing for more updates news breakdowns and reviews just like this follow me on social media as linked in the description down below and other places but thank you so much for watching i hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you fellow people of westeros in the next video goodbye